Hi, everyone. So I wanted to take this time to talk a bit more about the z-score we calculated in class and also to see how that connects to p-values and you know, what this has to do with the normal distribution. So I'm going to argue that actually this statistic is very intuitive and it's something you could have come up with on your own. So let's get started. What are we doing again? Well, we're looking at A-B testing, so I'll write that up here. And so what happens in A-B testing is we usually have two groups. We have a group A, and we have group B, right? Well, let's say group B gets some alternative treatment. And remember, as we discussed in class, you, uh, these are randomly assigned. And let's say we might believe that this alternative treatment is beneficial. So how can we track this? Maybe a metric we're using is, let's say, uh, profits from each group. Right, this is one metric. We can discuss many, many more. Um, so, you know, just kind of offhandedly, what our hope here is we would um, we would expect, if we believe that the alternative treatment is better, we would expect that the average profits from group B are much greater than the average profits of group A, right? And so I can calculate this, right? So let average two equal the average profits from group B. Right, and similarly, I'm going to say average one is equal to the average profits from group A. That's something you can easily calculate, right? You can use Excel, uh, you just add them up, divide by the total number. Okay, so again, we, we would accept uh, B, the alternative treatment, if Average two oops, is much greater than average one. We want to say this with some level of confidence. So the first thing you might ask is, what does this mean? Well, uh, you know, we can talk about uh, the average of group two of group B being greater than the average of group one. Um, and, no, and another way to write that thinking is to write as the following. So we say average of two minus average of one. So if average of two is much larger than the average of one, we would expect this to be greater than zero. Let's say, right? This is if, um, if the alternative is better. Then you would expect that this difference in averages is greater than zero, right? And this is something I think all of you have actually sort of proposed in class when you were talking about your different solutions. So our z-score very naturally looks at this difference, right? So the first thing in our z-score, so we'll start to write out the z-score, is we look at average two minus average one, right? This is super intuitive. Right, And so our thinking is if this z-score is large, that means that the average in group two is much larger than the average in group one. Right, So it should be no surprise to you that this difference in averages is in the z-score. But actually, this is not enough because we want to say something with confidence. Right, So how do we – maybe, maybe I'll, I'll write this in a different color. How do we add confidence levels? Right? So there are a couple things you can do here. If you knew the distribution of this difference in averages, you could exactly use that. But unfortunately, this is actually quite hard to calculate on a situational basis because it sort of depends on some other information. So it would be nice if I had a statistic that sort of worked in all of these uh, A-B testing scenarios. And so what we're going to do is we're going to transform this difference in averages somehow 
uh, so that I only ever have to use one distribution to describe it. And I'm going to say if we divide in some sense, I'm going to write in quotes, by some variance, I'm going to say no matter how great the difference uh, in variance is in between these groups, I can always know the distribution of this statistic. And so in this case, I'm going to divide. So one of the first things I'm going to divide by is the standard deviation, uh, group 2, over N2. And don't be scared by N2. Right, this is uh, this is just the the number of people in group two. Right, it's not too hard. I'll quickly erase that so we don't get too confused. Okay, right. So we're going to transform the statistic by the standard deviation over m. Um, but actually, that's not quite enough, right? So this sort of allows us to to do a transformation just based on group two. But you might be asking, well, what about group one? Well, that's a great question. So I'm going to sort of, um, I'm going to wave my hands a little bit here, but I'm also going to add the same quantity from group one over the size of group one. This is uh, what I'm about to do here is called a pooled variance. It's sort of just like the average variance in both groups, right? And so because I'm talking about variances, I'm going to square this and take the square root. This actually should not be scary to you. Um, because squaring things and taking the square root usually means that you're canceling them out, right? The square root of something squared is just that number. So really, you should just think about this here, this denominator. This here is sort of just like a pooled variance. Or maybe you can think of it as like in the average variance hand-waving a bit in both groups. Okay, so that's not too complicated. Um, and so again, all we have here in the numerator is we just have the difference in outcomes from our two groups divided by some term that I'm telling you is important because we're shrinking by the variability. Okay, and this is gonna allow us to do something quite nice. Um, but again, none of this should be too strange to you. It's kind of just like the difference in outcomes um, divided by um, some variance term that you that should be quite intuitive now. Um, and so this is our z-score. And as a quick tangent, in case any of you are wondering, um, actually, uh, another way you could write this is I look at this difference in averages, and I subtract this thing called mu1 minus mu2. And really what I'm testing is if the sample difference, which these averages are actually calculated from your data, so they're from samples, if they're different from the true mean of each of those populations, which in practice I never know, but I actually calculate this z-score. So and this is actually maybe a slightly important note. The z-score is calculated assuming that there's no difference between group one and group two. Or A and B in this case, I'm kind of interchanging them here. And so if that is true, then this uh, mu one minus mu two up here, that goes away because that is always zero. Because if the truth is that the difference is always zero, Right, then those true quantities always be zero. So I'm gonna erase them. You'll never have to think about them again. Just think of the formula I showed you in class, but that's just a tangent in case you're curious. Um, and then so if the if the way I'm calculating this statistic is that I assume that um, these difference the true differences is zero, I would expect that the sample differences, so this average one minus average two, I would expect that this um, is also very small and close to zero. Okay? Um, and so there's a lot of really nice math uh, that I could show, but um, I'll just show you the conclusion is when I write the z-score in that way, so when I write the z-score in this way up here, this z-score is distributed normally about zero with variance one. That's why I divided by that denominator term, and it's always centered around zero. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because uh, z is equal to zero, implies that average two, oops, minus average one, 
is equal to zero, right? Which means these two averages are exactly the same, right? So that tells us if, if I had a z-score of zero, that would tell us most likely that this um, experiment does not work and we should not change anything. But if you believe that the experiment worked, we would expect a very large uh, z-score, right? So z large tells us that average two is much greater than average one or greater than average one. The hope is it's much greater. And so I'm gonna focus on this last point here, is that if you calculate the Z statistic the way I told you to above, it's always distributed with enough, you know, obviously with enough data um, as a normal zero one. And that's how you calculate your p-values. So what is a normal zero one? Well, a normal zero one looks like this. It's a normal distribution. It's your nice bell curve where the peak of it occurs at zero. And this distribution has variance one, okay? And again, that's why we had that denominator term. And this makes sense. This tells us that on average, the majority of our z-scores should be about zero. Okay, so I should on average observe more things here. And I would only believe that my assumption that the averages are different is true if I observe a z-score that's highly improbable. And that would mean that I observe a z-score maybe out here in one of these tail locations. If I observe a z-score here, I would say that this is likely and tells me the alternative is not good. So I probably would not accept that. But if I observe one here, this means the alternative is appealing. And then you would tell me what confidence bounds you would need to really decide whether the alternative is appealing, right? Some of you in class said 5%. Some applications give us 1%. And so really what these percentages mean, or what is your threshold of error, right? So if I decide to accept the alternative, you know, how risky are you willing to be? Well, we're going to define this risk through a p-value. And so the p-value is actually a quite easy thing to understand. This is sort of like the probability that we that we are wrong in the sense that I accepted group two when I should not have. Okay, so what is the p-value? Well, I first calculate my z-score, and I figure out where on the standard normal the z-score lies. All right, so let's say, we'll do this in purple, the z-score ended up landing right here. We say, okay, this looks like we might want to accept the alternative. Now, what is the risk associated with that? Well, because we always know that z-score is distributed as a standard normal, the risk is just the area under this curve everywhere to the right of that z-statistic. And Excel can calculate this for you exactly. Right? That's why I had that norm dysfunction on the slides. So this is where my z-score is. And then the p-value, this, this whole area here, all summed up, this is my p-value. Okay? Um, and I can exactly calculate this in Excel using norm dist. Because Excel knows exactly how this curve looks like. It knows the exact function. And all I have to do is put in a number and Excel spits it back out, right? This is why in class someone asked me why I didn't need to use a z-table. That's because Excel knows something better than the z-table. The z-table is an approximation of, of this normal distribution, right? But Excel can calculate any point, not just any individual one, right? It's the power of computation. Um, and so sort of to sum things up, um, what I'm hoping you're getting out of all this is the z-score is intuitive. In fact, I bet you you could have come up with it on your own. And the p-value is sort of building off that intuitive nature, right? So the p-value is really useful because by construction, this z-score always looks like this normal distribution. And so the p-value is just my risk. So small p-value, so p-value that's small, sort of tells us that this z value occurred very far out in this normal distribution, right? And on average, I should observe it occurring in the middle, 
But if it's very, if it's a very small p value, that means it occurred very far away. So this means the alternative looks good. p value large means the alternative doesn't look good. And that probably means you had a p value land somewhere in the middle, right? Which on average you should, you should see because we originally assume that there's no difference. Um, and so I hope you sort of have these two takeaways that the z score is quite intuitive and the p value is also um, intuitive and builds off of why we constructed the z score in the way that we did. Um, so I, ho I hope this is useful. Um, please let me know if you have any more questions about this and I'm happy to uh, make more videos if you found this useful.